Today we are talking about elections with my panel. My name is Mishai Mongola, I'm an academic, and I'm very pleased to be joined by a group of eminent writers um, who I am sure you have had an opportunity to interact with yourself. Let me introduce them beginning from my far left is Dr. Wandia Njoya. Wandia is an academic and she's also a blogger. Next to her is Patrick Gadara. Patrick Gadara is a curator of The Elephant and he is also a blogger. And next to him is Yvonne O'War. Yvonne O'War is the award-winning um, author of, among other things, the book Dust. So we were going to talk about elections, but it seems to me that there is this one overarching conversation that everybody has. Rather than discussing manifestos or particular issues, we seem to be talking about this question of peace, or for some people it's a question of justice. So I'd like to just start by getting what each of you thinks about this particular peace versus justice. Um, discussion. Okay, I feel that we are not being honest in, in our contributions to this debate. On one hand, the people who are urging for credible elections are not spelling it out and saying they doubt that a credible election will produce an Uhuru victory. And on the other side, the people who are calling for peace are not being honest and saying that they support Uhuru and they expect that an Uhuru win should be accepted by everybody. So I think there's, a, there's some dishonesty on our side as Kenyans on what this peace debate is really about. So it's actually a continuation of the partisan divide in terms of the politics. Yes. Patrick, what are your thoughts? Well, I think that the, um, the whole discussion is predicated on um, a, a misunderstanding of what peace is. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that people have a very superficial idea um, uh, of peace. Um, that um, all we want is a continuation of the system as it is. So it's calm, we can still go out, go shopping, you know, uh, um, uh, you know get into a matatu. Do you want that? Everybody wants that. But that in itself is not peace because the underlying uh, infrastructure mm -hmm. on which it runs is a very violent one. You know, and I think we need to recognize that. And the reason why at election time we are constantly having this fear, you know, this terror of what's going to happen is because we really know, you know, and underneath it all there is really no peace. You know, it's always on the edge. It's always just about to go, you know. And that for me is not peace. And I think even uh, 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 President Kenyatta said it, you know, they say this is a perfunctory peace. He said that in his inaugural address in uh, 2013. So um, we need to go beyond that and to dig, the, to start questioning that underlying morass of fear, mistrust, violence. Mm -hmm. you know, and until we start actually dealing with that, we can't really speak of whether or not an election is going to bring peace. It, okay, it so I want to come back to that, how each of you would define peace, because you're telling me what not peace is. Mm -hmm. I want to know what peace is. But first I want to hear mm -hmm. Yvonne's thoughts. Actually, as I was speaking, both Wandia and Gadahara, uh, um, an analogy, or maybe two metaphors, two metaphors, if you, al if you will allow me. One is uh, we as a country, we probably are... It feels as if we are these people on uh, a creaky vessel, a very large ship. Uh, and we've been, every five years, the ocean is relatively calm. And then the storm comes. And then with the, the election storm comes, the tempest comes. And we are like the people on the boat screaming, oh, peace, 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 be calm. But the storm is coming and the vessel is creaking and there are holes in the boat. And, we, and our cry for peace is like the magic word we imagine that if we call it out, that somehow we shall navigate this storm and the holes in the boat will magically uh, you know, push the water out rather than let the water in. But we know the vessel is creaking. That's the first analogy. The second one is, uh, I think, more kind of, um, I think uh, obvious is uh, they, Kenya, 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 Kenya as the inhabitants of a house called Kenya, but the house is again uh, falling apart, and you know that your your parents are fighting, and there's war in the house, and we're like the children who are saying, hoping and praying this time the divorce will not come, and you, again it's that magical thinking, peace, 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 let there be peace, and somehow they. Over the couple of years, they've managed to overcome 
in a very difficult way the the uh, the issues that you know Gadara is talking about the underlying issues or pretend or paste over or bandage the underlying issues and you, you muddle along for the next five years before the crisis comes again and you're hoping that it will go away but it won't okay so I seem to hear from all of you that we are not at peace an election seems to be this crisis point and that's why we are now just before the elections going into this hyper ventilation about peace mm -hmm. What is peace? Even I would like to come back to that, but what, in your mind, can you give me a definition? What is peace? Peace for me is um, justice. That, that's what it is. I think when we don't have, when not everybody has access to healthcare, education, you know, good, good food, all the things that make us human beings, not just the material things, but also the cultural and social things like affirmation, dignity. When, when people don't have the ability to live their humanity in the full, then that is not peace. So you can find people with money who are able to go to the malls and wherever. It's calm, but it's not peace because they know that I cannot do this, you know, 10 neighborhoods away. This is not possible. So for me, peace is justice, equality, and humanity. Mm -hmm. So for you, when you say justice, you're not talking about people going to court necessarily, mm -hmm. but you're saying that there is justice in society. Yes. A sense of equality, a sense of everybody... Well-being. Okay, has mm -hmm. a chance to, to live well. Yes. Patrick, what's your definition of peace? Well, I think it's not too far uh, away from what uh, uh, Wandia has said. I think peace and justice uh, mm -hmm. cannot be separated. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I also think peace is security. I think peace is your ability to walk outside your house, you know, not to need to live mm -hmm. in gated community with fences mm -hmm. and watchmen and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. it's a security not just for one person, but for every uh, individual within a society, knowing that they are taken care of. Mm -hmm. It's also predictability, mm -hmm. you know. It's, it's knowing, you know, what the future will bring, you know. And I think the whole um, uh, the whole f uh, fear we have of, of, of what the election brings is a certain lack of predictability we mm -hmm. don't know mm -hmm. that you know there will be a tomorrow you know mm -hmm. after the eighth you know or what that tomorrow will look like you know so we are all afraid that's why you hear these stories of people moving out of their houses you know sharpening their pangas and stuff like that so um, I think in addition to justice, you really have to look at security. And security is not just security from um, a physical violence. It's security, it's mm -hmm. economic security. You know, it's mm -hmm. knowing where you're going to get your food. You know, it's knowing where uh, your kids are going to go to school, that they're getting a good education, you know, um, etc. Mm -hmm. Stuff like that. So I, I, I think if what we are right now talking about, at least as a country, is mm -hmm. only a sense of calm. What we want is a continuation of what is there, but that in itself is not peace. Mm -hmm. okay. I think both uh, uh, Galara and Wendy have got it so beautifully. Uh, but uh, I think peace is a component of a, of a, of a, of a bigger template of a human ideal, I think. It includes love, truth, justice, um, wholeness, well-being. And peace is also a consequence. When the infrastructure, if you want, if the if when the infrastructure for um, uh, you know the, to uphold the 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 human ideal is laid out, peace is a uh, peace becomes a fruit. It, it's not a thing you can command. You shall now be at peace. You can't. Right. And and that's that's that seems to be the, the part of the magical thinking that um, um, as a nation and as a people we seem to prefer. So what I'm hearing, and which I think when a lot of the conversation goes on, it's about violence. And we are saying actually violence is only, this lack of violence mm -hmm. is only just part of it. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about, I think it's Martin Luther King who built this whole theology on peace equals justice when you were talking about that. But also, Johan Galton has got these notions of negative peace, which is, there is no violence. But then positive peace is where all these other elements that you're bringing in mm -hmm. come in. And it's not just about the moment of election, but it's also every day, what people experience in their everyday, and people are literally at peace with themselves inside. So arguably, 
we already, you know, and I think you, we're going to come to that argument. I think it's you who makes it, Gabara, that uh, we're not at peace even as we speak, even before we go into the elections. Yeah, I, I think I like what uh, Ivona said uh, of, of, of peace as a consequence. Mm -hmm. You know, that it is not something you, you, you command, you declare it, you know, that, uh, that you're at peace. You know, there's got to be work that is put in to generate peace. You know, and for the longest time throughout Kenya's history, we actually haven't put in that work. So in a sense, we have no way, in fact, we have no right to even say we deserve peace because we, are not, we haven't put in the work that is, is required to actually generate it, to ensure that um, the people within our societies, all of them have access to the sorts of things that would mean their lives are secure, they're predictable that um, they are free of violence. It's not just a violence, a physical violence, you know, it's the violence of poverty, it's the mm -hmm. violence of ill health. That mm -hmm. all of these things, you know, the violence of history, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. if we don't deal with that of injustice, then the, we really don't have a call, you know, to stand up and say we want peace, which is mm -hmm. what we are all drumming together, we're all mm -hmm. shouting about. You know, all we want is calm, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that's about it. <laughs> so I want to unpack, you guys have said so much, I want to unpack each one of the, you know, I want to unpack um, the, the notion of elections are a point of crisis. Mm -hmm. I want to unpack, unpack what you just talked mm -hmm. about, this sense that there's a history that we must deal with, mm -hmm. and then that there's a sense towards the future, mm -hmm. that we must also talk about the immediate future in terms of what happens after 8th August mm -hmm. 2017, because Nane Nane has a sense of hope for some, but there's also a lot of fear around that. And then what happens between 2017 and the next election? So that by the time we get to 2022, we're not back where we are. Because this feels like back in 2013. Only this time, these calls for peace are really being challenged in a way they were not being challenged in 2013. Wandia, you wrote um, something on Facebook that, I mean, I saw there's a lot of conversation about, and you seem to be taking on this, this notion of why we talk about peace every five years. It seems like it is our five year, let's now come and talk about peace and elections as a point of crisis for Kenya. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit more about that and some of the pushback you got? Okay, I, I was talking mainly about... Um, Okay, for the last five, year, four years actually since the elections, I've been saying that our institutions are running down, are going worse and worse and worse. And these institutions are where we get the ability to resolve conflict. So we resolve it in our education system, through healthcare, through all these institutions. But because they're being run down, we are reaching a point where the only place to, to resolve conflict as a nation is in elections. And so I looked historically at what we've done from independence. Independence was a resolution to a conflict between us and, and Britain. We've done the TJRC. We've done the Dongo report that talked about the conflict around land. We've, we've done all these things which have not been implemented. And every time they're not implemented, we get it's one less chance to be peaceful. Mm -hmm. So now we have shut down all these opportunities to be peaceful, and at the end, we are left with only elections, which is where we shouldn't have been here. Mm -hmm. We should have been able to resolve the land conflict, power, economics, all these things. We should have been able to resolve them in the different institutions of our country, but we didn't. So now we are at the place where only elections seems to be standing between us and, and a breakdown. Although, you know, I'm a Christian, I believe in God, I believe miracles happen. I'm not saying it's that if elections don't go well, there'll be war, but I'm just saying institutionally as a society, we have left a conflict that should have been resolved elsewhere, we have left it up to elections. And so the stakes are too high mm -hmm. for people to just let go just like that. So you feel that people feel the only way I can get justice is that at elections I'll have a chance to elect somebody who would come in and take care of the things that I feel all these other institutions, all these other mm -hmm. movements have been unable to resolve. Yes, I mean like take for example healthcare and education which are my pet subjects. We have not been able to reform them. They are still being privatized, especially healthcare, which means that we are still going to depend on calling a relative or calling an MP 
to sort out our health bills. Now imagine if we didn't have to do that. Then elections would not be such a high stakes mm -hmm. event for us. But now they are because it's not only about who is going to be president. It's about am I going to be able to go to hospital? Uh, is my kid going to get a place in school? These things are tied to other social services which we have refused to sort out and incidentally we are not even discussing them. When we don't discuss the manifestos, we are refusing to discuss the issues that would have made elections not be such a high stakes. Mm -hmm. And actually event. today we should have been discussing mm -hmm. manifestos, but we are not. Yes. What was the pushback you got on this? What, what, what were the people who disagreed with you? What, what was their problem? I don't think they are disagreeing with me. They are reacting to the pain that the post brings out. On once, actually, okay, the, the those who talk about credible elections kind of supported me, so I didn't get much flack from there. Mm -hmm. But the side that is hurting so much from that post is saying that I am calling for violence, and I am not. I don't. I don't think I even talk of mm -hmm. violence. But also, they are ignoring the histo the history that I went through. I talked about the history of Kenya since '63 till today but they are ignoring the historical narrative and only focusing on elections, which is actually my point. My point is, mm -hmm. when we ignore all these historical factors and wait just for elections, then elections is going to disappoint and is going to hurt. So people are now accusing me of preaching violence. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll come yeah. to that thing that if people then, elections is the only thing we can change, and if that doesn't happen, what would their options be? So we'll come to, let's, let's look at the options. But I'd be really interested, Yvonne, what do you think about what Wadia said? And mm. um, uh, everything that she says, I agree with. And not only that, I'm uh, also challenged to think more deeply uh, about this issue, think differently. Certainly around the issue of the institutions, the violence, the chaos starts in, the deterioration of institutions, but I think the tragedy was also linked to that which he has said is that some of these institutions have been willfully and deliberately run down for the sake of private interests so that the people who run them down we can then valorize as the great entrepreneurs of our country and we turn them into the heroes mm -hmm. in our national mythology. And quite frankly, a nation that builds itself upon, li upon lies and corruption and a disruption of the things that it holds true to itself is not a nation that is intending peace for itself, quite frankly. Um, so, I mean, I don't know, I, and, and, but partly, and maybe not to be too harsh about it, I wonder if part of the challenge comes from the fact that uh, we are a highly and deeply and profoundly traumatized people. And it's a multi-generational uh, trauma that's passed down. And the nature of trauma that's not dealt with is that it amplifies itself in, in the next generation and in the next generation. So you have a people who are screaming inside, inside their deeper selves, um, but don't even understand, necessarily understand why they're even screaming. They just know they're wounded, so deeply wounded, so deeply bruised in the community at home, within themselves and in the country. But we're also a nation that has managed to very successfully develop a narrative of, weave a narrative of silence around the things that hurt us the most. So we will uh, accept and move on. We will put on our makeup and wear our beautiful dresses or, or, or suits and uh, you know get on with the job at hand. But so I worry, I worry when a nation that has, not, has never found a methodology or a way to address its own particular and very specific ghosts. I want to come back to that, but you know, I, I struggle with this notion that all of us are hurting. Because there are people, and this I, I suspect are the people who pushed back to you, who are saying, okay, fine, we may have issues, we may need to resolve them. But we are not, you know, we are not a failed state. You know, Kenya runs. <laughs> the economy is working. You know, we are not people who say our kids cannot go to school. We have, you know, I mean... There are many of us who feel, yes, we're not saying Kenya is perfect, but as Kenyans, we are saying we are proud of what we have built. There are things that do work in this nation. And there seems to be this negative sense of everything is bad, and that's why elections have to be the crisis point. And I just want to push back that not everybody is hurting. Not everybody is unhappy with the Kenya that we have. We're not saying it is perfect, but some people do honestly feel that let's protect 
what we have. And the fear is that this thing of elections is the only time we can solve our crisis increases the fear. And that's why people then start to talk very badly in terms of if this fails, if, if my person does not get in, I am willing to do A, B, C, D. And that's what increases the fear that we have. Patrick, um, what would you say? Well, uh, I, I'd really push back on that. Uh, first, I think we've got to ask who Kenya works for. Um, and I think for the vast majority of the people who call themselves Kenya, Kenya does not work for them. You know, um, uh, when we talk about people going to school and stuff, for most kids, school does not work for them. You know, um, uh, uh, I mean, you take a good example would be um, the introduction of free primary education, what it did to schools, and the fact that even amongst poor people, they are running away from it. You know, it doesn't work for them. Um, I think we've got this system that we inherited. Um, uh, uh, it's, it's a very colonial system. You know, that we never reformed. Actually, I think that for me that was a central insight of the TGRC report, that we never changed anything. All we did is replace the people at the top. And it does work for them, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but for the rest of us, we still live with the oppressions, the poverty, the injustice that any colonial system But Patrick, create. you cannot say that when the polls are currently saying half of this country are voting for the status quo. Half may be saying we want to change. But half, it's not the elite, it's yes, not like but, uh, 20% uh -huh. who are voting for the status quo. Half this country is convinced that this country is on the right track. Exactly, but this is what I want to, uh, to get to. Um, uh, first, um, the, the polls are interesting because half the country might be, say, might be voting for status quo. But when you read things like 61% think we're going on the, the wrong track, it means yes. even the people voting, voting. Yeah. for the status quo no, we are going in the wrong way, you know, at least a good proportion of them. Mm -hmm. My question is then why are they voting? Mm -hmm. exactly. you know? And what do elections, what have they come to mean for us? Mm -hmm. you know, and I think that um, given the, in, uh, the underlying infrastructure that we've built our quote-unquote democracy on, mm -hmm. you know, we've had a misconception that this was made for us. You know, mm -hmm. and all we need to do is to tweak it so that it works. You know, we just need to remove some of the bad guys who are in power, <laughs> and then mana will flow. You know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, down. But we've tried this. You know, we tried it in 2003 where we voted in all these people who had integrity, who for a long time had fought against the Moi mm -hmm. dictatorship, but suffered for it. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, for a long time, and yet in the space of months, mm -hmm. you know it all changed against us. The system isn't broken, and this is where I, I, I think I, I, mm -hmm. I've got to uh, um, uh, take, I take it a little different from what these guys are saying. Um, the system isn't broken. The institutions aren't being run down. Those institutions are not set up mm -hmm. to benefit the Kenyan. You know. In fact, the reason why we are so invested in elections is because it's the only chance we get to have even the semblance of a voice. Mm -hmm. You know, throughout the five years that people who win, who are in power, are there, we are effectively shut out of it. Mm -hmm. you know? And we mm -hmm. perform this idea of democracy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like we are actually being consulted about <laughs> things <laughs> and stuff. But it's not there, you know. It's all an illusion that's, mm -hmm. the, the, that's there. So come election time... We're trying to get what we can out of them before they disappear again mm -hmm. into five years. Think of how we talk about something like the national cake. It's almost like it exists somewhere <laughs> in the ether. And all we do is to send guys to give uh, to get us, you know, a little bit of it. You know, stuff. So, as long as my person is represented, yeah, you know, it's not even a very, you know, it's not even a, a reasonable size. It's just and, a crumbs. Yeah, and, and, and what that makes us not see mm -hmm is that there is no national cake. What we have is a system that was built on the logic of extraction. It was built mm -hmm. by the colonials to extract mm -hmm. wealth, dignity from the, many, uh, from, from the majority and feed it up to a few guys at the top. It does that very well, and it continues to do that. Now, in order to legitimize itself, it gives us an illusion that we are somehow participating in this, in our very mm -hmm. own oppression, in our very own extraction. And that's why we even end up saying, oh, you know, the problem, for example, and it's corruption, 
you know, the problem is Kenyans. Kenyans are mm. too corrupt. <laughs> but this is not oh. true. Kenyans are the victims of corruption. It's being taken from them. Corruption is the logic of the system. And and I really like that point mm-hmm. about um, that it's the only elections are the only time we get a, a semblance of a voice. Mm. Because think even about the way some of us who comment online, we are always being told, what's your solution? Mm-hmm. Basically, it's to shut us down. Mm-hmm. Or we are told, why are you not in politics? Why are you just commenting? You know? So it's essentially to say, if you're not a politician, shut up. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. there's no place for us as Wanainchi to comment and reform our institutions. We are told to wait for five years to come. And so the tragedy is that we then tie that to people to being the politicians are the ones who will bring us change mm-hmm. and not to mm-hmm. the, the actually not what, what is the what does the manifesto say? Mm-hmm. How will that change happen? How can we contribute? Even mm-hmm. you were going to say something. No, I, I as both the especially Gadara and Wendy are speaking, I, the the image, the metaphor of this uh, again <laughs> Again, one of those images of uh, one of those 1950s lorries that has been on stones for a long, long time. <laughs> Elections turns all of us into mechanics, and each of us, <laughs> and that vote is a spanner. This each of us, <laughs> it's going to move. Yeah. This, time, <laughs> this time, it will move. <laughs> Are you holding a piece up and saying, this is the solution? <laughs> this is the thing. Another one is saying, no, no. And, and uh, another one is saying, no, that's the front, that's the back. And uh, mm-hmm. there are a whole lot of us saying, no, 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 that's the back, that's the front. Mm-hmm. So at least for every, every five years, we are all mechanics tinkering with this thing and hoping that the miracle will happen. <laughs> Actually, well, I would tweak that and say, it's not even that we're in mechanics, but we're all gathered around particular mechanics and we're all handing that mechanic. <laughs> oh, you guys try this, try this, try this. And this candidate is supposed to take all our whatever and use it to somehow... And there are multiple candidates all around this thing. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but it's also the idea that by doing this, they can fix it. You know, mm. and, and I think for me that yeah. is the, the thing is we don't see that we don't even want to fix the system mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. it is not for us it wasn't made for us, it was made to take from us mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. so in essence the what everybody is afraid of is the work of actually taking it all, all apart, apart and, and then and beginning it you're right so yeah. even before yeah. we do that yes, yes. because I do want to come to what, what yeah. is that work yeah. but I want to pick up on something Yvonne said this thing of this, there have been these years of haunting, this thing that we're carrying, the baggage. Mm. And you also talked about that we inherited a system and that we did nothing with that system. So I want us to just go back to that. Yvonne, mm. I've recently been performing your work and it's scaring me to death, so I'm putting it aside. <laughs> but especially in the last month, I've been performing this whole passage around Tom Boyer mm. and Tom Boyer's death. And I'm aware that in your book, Dust, it's set in the background of the post election. Actually, on the elections, the 2007, 2008, the 2007 elections mm-hmm. and the violence that follows. But it's happening somewhere in the background. You're not really, if you're not talking, we're not seeing the violence of that. Mm-hmm. And yet you keep, every time I've heard you talk about it, you say this is a novel that was brought, was birthed by this post-election violence. Mm-hmm. And so you seem to be saying that there is something, this idea of the past about history and what we're experiencing now mm. seems to be quite important. I'd like to talk a little bit about that haunting, and then let's talk a little bit about this before we now go into what is it that we need to do to change. Mm-hmm. Um, it's hard to... I don't even know where to begin with this. Uh, you know, it, um, let, me, let me start with a couple of questions. Um, for example, what is Kenya? Uh, you know, start, start very simply with that. Uh, and in Kenya is many, many, many things. But primarily, the moment it became Kenyan and was baptized Kenya, if 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 it were to be very cold cold minded about it, it would be it was an Englishman's project, um, set up for the purposes of trade, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but that is its its con- it, that is its uh, you know it's in, in its current manifestation. Yet the country is older and bigger. I mean, Kenya could be the whole Indian Ocean. Kenya could be the, the the trade route from the ocean to the Congo, for example. There are so many layers and complexities in the idea of uh, where we find ourselves and that which we define as our place of belonging uh, and of citizenship that 
we don't engage with at all. But it doesn't mean that it has gone away. It has not gone away. It's there. It lurks somewhere. And so linked to the, not only the extractive state, but the whole narrative and the whole history of um, Kenya from that, you know, let's say 20th century Kenya to its present, is a history of a, con a repetition of violence, of genocides, of massacres that are not even in our, not even in our history books. Uh, we don't talk about the actual meaning and impact and layering and, uh, of, of, of the Mau Mau um, experience. The fact that it was, you know, you have extremes. Let's say uh, 35 Europeans killed, 20,000 uh, uh, you know, Africans murdered by, by a process. What does that actually mean? I think Adara asked that earlier. What does the Mau Mau actually mean? Um, for, for communities and for peoples. What happens with the wounds within the communities that have been buried in oaths of silence? And we have processes to silence that which needs to be talked about. Uh, and, it's, and it's willful and it's intentional. We shall not talk about this. Um, uh, it, so think of the histories of our assassinations, so the latest being uh, Chris um, Sando. In fact, it's, it's, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's an extreme of reaction, but there's also an extreme of, we've been here before, mm -hmm. and we'll be here again. But we don't ever ask, why is it that, especially the illusion of post-independence, why has the post-independence state been characterized by these seasons of massacres, of slaughters, of its own citizens, Right? And why is that? And, and why? How? How come the nation? The nation. I mean, the people. How come as people we it, we do not react more strongly, more powerfully, more viscerally about this thing? Is it very? Is it possible that the things we do not, the things that wound us the most, the ghosts we have kept in our closets, uh, which are rattling, <clears throat> is that the reason why we keep? It's almost as if we keep circling, the same grave, the same watering hole, walking around. I think one day you said marking time, walking around until we find ourselves in the same place. And we thought we had progressed. <laughs> or we're in exactly the same place. Mm. But everybody knows they are, they are, they're skeletons beneath that flowered, uh, you know, the manicured lawn. They're, they're, they're ghosts. They're, 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 the body's buried right there. And the bodies did not get there because of natural causes. They got there because they were assassinated, they were murdered, they were killed. They were eliminated, they were erased. And we know their names, except that we've also erased that. How do we imagine that we as a people can find peace our, our, in, as, as, as individuals, as communities, as families, when we are all complicit in that which we know but refuse to talk about? And refuse to tell or name. And, so and in fact, I think the reason why we don't want to talk about it is because we don't believe we are human. That's it for me. <laughs> we actually that. don't believe that we are human and that to kill a human being always deserves a kind of redress. Because that's the essence of justice. If somebody dies, and the, the African sensibility is that if some, somebody dies, the ancestor must be at peace. If they died unfairly, we must appease. Mm -hmm. But we are not appeasing mm -hmm. because we have lost our sense of humanity, which, come, which is part of the trauma of colonialism, that we lost our sense of dignity. And so when people die, it doesn't outrage us. Mm -hmm. We only talk about the relationship, oh, the father, the son, the mm -hmm. what. But we don't really think this was a human, human being, being, a member of our humanity mm -hmm. who went just like that. And that death must be appeased. We don't have that sense. And that comes from our colonial history. The fact that our traditions were, were, were denigrated by colonialism mm -hmm. and we were given these beliefs that don't affirm us. I, I think I would, sorry, I, just, I, sorry, I would disagree one day. I think it's specific cultures and communities that have lost that sense of dignity and humanity. Because for a lot of cultures, more, and so the, and the, the varieties of nations and cultures in this space, the idea of the murder and the slaughter of a human being is such a terrible and terrifying thing. And, 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 that, and, and that becomes, I think then part of our, our challenge becomes who are the cultures and peoples who are willing to transcend, or not transcend, transgress the limits of our human, uh, of, of the sense of our humanity in order to cause such trauma and, 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 and tragedy and feel nothing about it. 
So yeah, and why? Because and I mean, why, I, yeah, I, yeah. I was yeah. recently going back through the TGRC mm -hmm. Volume Four, the one on massacres, mm -hmm. and it hit me again. I think the first time I read it, I just you know I was trying to get through the whole report, so there was just you know read, read, read. Mm -hmm. But it hit me again that this history of trauma. This history of massacres, this history of those kind of deep historical injustices are laid in the foundations even of the colony, leave alone mm -hmm. the nation. Mm -hmm. And part of it, you know, when we talked about the agenda for insistence on you need to deal with your history, is because you're dealing with that trauma. So I would ask Yvonne, what has happened to some, you know, from your question, what, what makes people, because I think all our cultures started out with mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. what makes some people desensitized to that. What's happened to them? What's in that history that means that either, you know, we, we, we suffered such trauma that we can now traumatize others, mm -hmm. or we suffered such trauma we can no longer speak about it. But we can't go back. I think recently we were talking about, let's not go back to TGRC, because it will open mm -hmm. old wounds, which means those wounds have never healed. Mm -hmm. And yet you're bringing in um, I know Patrick, is, um, Patrick mentioned Patrick, something, yeah. I want mm -hmm. to come back to him, mm -hmm. in terms of the state and the institutions. Mm -hmm. But we're also talking about, you're bringing in the question of historical injustices. Mm -hmm. So back to the conversation on peace and justice. But also that question of being a traumatized people mm -hmm. who are silenced. You know the famous lines you write, Kenya's official languages, mm -hmm. English, Kiswahili and silence. Mm -hmm. But there was also memory. So we're, we're silenced. But we're still haunted mm -hmm. by this memory that we can't completely erase. We can't completely, it can't go away. It's still there haunting. But Patrick, you wanted to yeah. say something. Yeah, um, I, I, I think we should also think um, of, I mean, kind of this multitude of people, of human beings, who've gone through this really traumatic experience called colonialism that continues uh, till today. You know, it mm -hmm. did not end it in 1963. You know. <laughs> And we've got to trace it all the way back. And I think the way, uh, one of the ways that people have learned to sort of deal with that history and also to deal with the continuing oppression is, is to operate at two levels, at different levels. So um, I think at one level you try to be human when you are in your house with your people, you know, and uh, 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 you, you see these people are they are helpful when you, you say, I'm, I'm, I need to go to hospital. You know, yeah. uh, stuff, and you have a, a, a harambe, and people mm -hmm. are sending in mm -hmm. money. You know, there's a very human thing about that. But there's another level, and these are the level of the state, where you can start seeing Kenyans as creatures of this state, of Kenyanness as itself, a creation mm -hmm. of this thing we call Kenya. I remember when I was a, 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 a child, we would be told that you belong to the state. Mm -hmm. That and you can't even commit suicide because you are robbing the state of something, you know. So the state owns you, it creates that Kenyan. And I think at that level, that humanity doesn't exist. That's the level at which oppression is normalized, becomes okay. And a lot of times you will see the things that our state does, you know, and the reasons, I mean, and, and the, the way it keeps... Um, uh, performing oppression and and, 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 and pushing the, the sort of um, fake narratives of history, you know, mm -hmm. the sort of struggles that it, uh, it privileges. So Momo being one of them as if there were no other struggles mm -hmm. um, uh, 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 that existed. All those are meant to create a particular type of Kenya, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So, and they, that also in itself creates conflict. You know, because that particular is not a full human being. He's just, uh, 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 what's the word? It's uh, uh, a factor of production. You know, mm -hmm. he is there to pay taxes. He is there to uh, develop or to mm -hmm. uh, participate in development, mm -hmm. not to live his life, not to enjoy his life. He's a know. subject, not an actor. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, and I think till we start interrogating why these levels should exist, mm -hmm. you know, until we start asking questions like why Kenya, mm -hmm. you know, what is the point of it, mm -hmm. you know, and because this is not something that we got together and we decided to form, mm -hmm. you know, so why do we need it? Why do we need this state, you know, and if it's there, if we don't need it, to do what? To perform which sorts of services, you know, mm -hmm. and we actually need a real and proper conversation about this. Mm -hmm. And it's those conversations we keep running away from. Mm 
mm-hmm. you know yeah. because yeah. in discussing them then mm-hmm. you will be discussing what the state has not been doing and also what it actually has been doing mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. um I, i like the idea of the haunting um i wrote a piece um i just immediately after the 2013 election about the whole specter of fear that we have you know and i likened it to um i don't know if you guys have watched this movie the poltergeist you mm-hmm. know where these guys built a house on a graveyard you know mm-hmm. and they're constantly being haunted by this uh, uh spirits from underneath you know and i think kenya is the same it's built on this okay. cemetery you yes. know yes. that includes all sorts of dead bodies all sorts of injustices and mm-hmm. stuff and until we actually appease those we deal with those uh, demons and mm-hmm. there we clean out as i said in the peace the foundations of our nation we won't be at peace we will yeah. it will constantly be there and every five years they turn up you know <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. 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 <laughs> i remember being at <laughs> 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 school's drama training i think in 2008 and somebody I think it was bigapo talked about what kenya needs is not i mean it's got nothing against the national days of prayers but he said we need a national day of mourning, mourning. Mm-hmm. Yes, and he yes, said yes, where we yes, sit yes. down yes. and each person gets a chance to tell their story mm-hmm. yes. and we don't blame each other mm-hmm. but we cry mm-hmm. and we mm-hmm. cry mm-hmm. to the point where i am not grieving only about my what's happened yes. to me and my people yeah. mm-hmm. but what's happened to you and yes. your people mm-hmm. yes. and he said when we are at the point where we are truly no longer crying for my community yes. but we're crying for, for your community yes. mm-hmm. and yes. for all of us wow. then we can start mm-hmm. the work that now you're also talking mm-hmm. about which is yes. to say you know I, i don't know this i like this notion of ask ourselves why does kenya exist mm-hmm. in the way that it exists mm-hmm. and then what happened We were, we were we were actually created as a colonial space mm-hmm. for a colonial mission mm-hmm. and there was an imperial britain had an imperial mission mm-hmm. we were only serving that agenda right. mm-hmm. what happened at 1963 when we became independent mm-hmm. that changed that the, the, the structure of that state which is i think you were, you were yeah you were i, I think we need to even interrogate that idea that we became independent, independent. <laughs> and what does that actually <laughs> mean Okay. You know, yes. for me it seems very much independence was was a hoax was uh, was fake um if you think about it uh, i'll take uh, uh, one example which is the kipande one mm-hmm. one of the big grievances that was put uh, there mm-hmm. you know we still carry a kipande mm-hmm. today you still <laughs> walk in ta- right. mm-hmm. you walk in town a policeman stops you demands your kipande which is what used to happen to your fathers <laughs> you know before that's why they wanted to, uh, they were fighting to get rid of that mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. you can be arrested and put in jail because you don't have it mm-hmm. as if this is a space you're not supposed to be in mm-hmm. if you don't carry that pass mm-hmm. you know it's still there the, the 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 system that they were fighting against railing against was maintained and what they were given is something called independence mm. which comes with all these accoutrements of flags and anthems and 21 gun salutes for and your leader <laughs> you know, and stuff and that's why but I what do, do those things uh, I mean do, those weren't the things we were fighting for we were fighting for our humanity so didn't we change that to the 2010 constitution no the 2010 constitution was the articulation of a vision and that's where people i yes. think got it wrong mm-hmm. is we thought getting the constitution was the end mm-hmm. but actually all it does is articulate a vision of the sort of kenya we might want and it's not a perfect vision you know it's something that we can all keep in, in, mm-hmm. in improving and interrogating it's rewriting it, rewriting the you know you know that that lorry that bandia lorry right. it's rewriting <laughs> the manual right. and, and and the thing is mm. the, the i mean if, if you look again at our history it's not the first time we have tried to put in a new constitution on top of this um uh, under structure of of of, of oppression mm. you know mm. um our ag uh, gitu migai wrote a very interesting paper in uh, in in uh, 1992 you know uh, where he said what happened to the independence constitution the uh, constitution in 1962 which it was very similar if you read it is very similar to the 2010 constitution mm. in terms of devolution the creation of uh, the different houses the protection of rights bills of rights and stuff is they tried to impose it on this colonial infrastructure and what happened is instead of the colonial infrastructure changing they changed the constitution, the constitution. they undermined it mm-hmm. that's the same thing that's happening now mm-hmm. you know and mm-hmm. i think until we start recognizing that the constitution is just a vision mm-hmm. but it's there to try and dismantle 
So we the, have to the work is it. to dismantle exactly, mm. and by implementing it, we mean we've got to dismantle that colonial infrastructure, mm. you know, mm. and that is the work that we are running away from. Mm. I think just to add on to what Gadar said, I think it's important to point out that. Uh, part of the mythology, the alienation and the silencing, is that we have assumed colonial means British or white man. Right? Yes. We forget that colonialism is an ideology that any human being can adopt. And we have the most, uh, how do you say, most, the most orthodox colonialists uh, among us running this country or involved in this country. Mm. And it's not, colonialism is not about the color of skin. I think that mm. needs to be made very, right, very yeah. clear. No, no, that, 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 yeah. In fact, sometimes you hear some government officials talking and you think, you cannot be saying this. <laughs> it sounds so colonial. And they justify it by saying it's the state. It's my performance contract. Mm -hmm. This is my duty to government. In this Kenya of 2010 constitution. So what I'm hearing is the kind of decolonizing discourses. You know when Guki talked about mm -hmm. decolonizing the mind. Mm -hmm. We still haven't done the work that 50 years ago we set out to work. Which was to decolonize the mind of the Kenyan mind, what does it mean to be an independent country? What are the consequences, therefore, to the actual state, the institutions of the state? What does it mean to be a citizen and say, not a subject? You know, I'm, I'm, I might uh, I'm just, sorry to interrupt, but to, to quickly push back, I don't think we should really be thinking in terms of its uh, uh, work we set out to do 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. 50 years ago, we were presented with simply another version of this colonial thing. I mean, they just papered it over, the called it independence, <laughs> and maintained the system. The work has been on, you know, from Centuries. the 20s, from even before the white guys came, mm. to be fully human, to mm. actually, mm. you know, to, to, to allow um, uh, the human being to enact his humanity, to mm. live his life. You know, when you think of um, uh, people like Karithuku, you know, and stuff, they were, all, they were all fighting for this. I agree. You know, so that's the work that I, I think, think what at I meant some point, was that in the 60s, there was a lot of conversation where people mm -hmm. said, we're now independent. Mm -hmm. And there were people who said, actually, we're not. Right, yeah. And that the, the work of decolonizing is not something that ended with flag independence. Mm -hmm. It's a continuing right. work, right? Yeah. So I'm interested that you, you, you took that um, fight for life to the 19, to the 20s because mm -hmm. then arguably you could say that it, is, it had been going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, we're just talking about as context changes, people find different things to fight for. People right. find mm -hmm. a way of organizing. Mm -hmm. And what happens in, I think, 1920s when we officially become a colony mm -hmm. and we start to have this sense of it's not just about mm -hmm. me and my people. I think Harry Fuku famously said, I don't want to be with the Kikuyu Association, I right. want to think of a bigger, mm -hmm. a bigger community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, Yvonne, you wanted to add some thoughts to the idea of decolonizing. I saw your face there. Okay, uh, I, 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 I worry about the privileging of one historical movement, mm -hmm. the colonial, um, the colonial experience, the colonial project, and and say focusing, particularly say on decolonization when there was a host of a. I feel very strongly there's a host of, of, of other historical energies and forces that influence and impact the place, the space in which we find ourselves that, um, that, that, that I, I think if we, our incapacity, I think, in terms of, you know, the post-colonial narrative, the focus on decolonization means that the whole variety of other forces mm -hmm. get left out and then we follow this one track as if it's the only way, as if the colonial force, the colonial energy, the colonial historical experience was the entire meaning of the African mm -hmm. crisis or the African situation. You understand? So could that, because my understanding of decolon, mm. de decolonizing is, to, is, is exactly to do that, to say that um, we, we, the colonial project sits at the heart of, even when we say, how did we come to be Kenya? Mm -hmm. How did the mythical 42, 42, 44, 45, <laughs> however many, 1890, whichever people groups came together to mm. make Kenya. What made us that group and not, as you said, everybody between the ocean and the Congo River mm. was that you have that colonial project. But your argument is that there are other forces that preceded that imperial project and yes. it continues after the colonial project, does, yes. but we've been locked into this space so that even the state becomes the form of the state that the colonial 
state was handed over and that's the only thing that and that's the narrative doing. that perpetuates itself that is 42 tribes when actually the reality we know mm -hmm. is that we're probably around 115 different ethnic communities in just in this Kenyan space independent with the entire histories um, uh, so I, I, I guess what I'm trying to say and not too clearly is simply that part of our challenge is probably also the challenge of lexicon and vocabulary and grammar um, the naming of the conditions in which we find ourselves, mm -hmm. the, the, our continuous habit of bor bor borrowing and appropriating without adapting to understand mm -hmm. what does this actually mean for, the, for, the, for our reality, for our history, for our heritage, for our experiences, for our stories, mm -hmm. right? I bet if we actually did that, we would be using completely different terms. Okay, yeah, I, I want to pick up. Wait, hold on. I want to pick up on this. What does it actually mean? Mm -hmm. And bring it back to elections, right? Well, I, I, and Patrick, I want to, you say what you have to say, but I want you to go into this um, blog post that you wrote mm -hmm. that said, regardless of what happens, mm -hmm. whether you know whoever wins at the next elections mm -hmm. in a week's time, whether or not there's a Supreme Court um, appeal, whether or not we go to runoff. Whether or not you know we just accept and move on, you know whatever happens, oh, both fight. sides accept. Whether we fight, your argument is there's still not going to be peace. Yes. So run the two together. Um, okay. Um, first, I start with this idea of decolonization, mm -hmm. um, uh, which for me is a privileging of the state. We don't really see the state as simply a particular political uh, form of organization. You know, um, for us, it's, it's almost been given a mythical status. Mm -hmm. You know, Kenya has always been there. Kenya mm -hmm. will always be there, which is untrue. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and I think we are given stories, you know, um, and, and even histories that are the history of the state as if those are the histories of the people, mm -hmm. you know, who are there. Mm -hmm. And the struggles of the state therefore become the struggles of the people, mm -hmm. you know. And I think we need to distinguish those. Um, coming back to the idea of peace, um, I Hold think... On. So you're actually telling me that we as a people could at one point decide this state isn't yeah, working for us? Yeah, doesn't work for us. Okay, that's you a know, we must explore some other It's tribe. just a way of, of, of organizing it. You know, states didn't exist prior to the 1490s, you know. But the people, <laughs> you know, the people, people were always there. Yes, you know, yes. Or we can say that the state you know. is subordinate and to actually, us. And actually, if yeah. you're to the take The sovereignty it, of the people, yes. not of, of the, the right. states. And, yes. and if yeah. you even when we were to take it wider, and we can have this discussion another time, it's also the whole idea of Africa that was actually created, you know, mm -hmm. so that we think that, oh, we have something more in common with the people in West Africa than we do <laughs> in Europe, which is, well, not really true. Um, but anyway, that would that, probably be a discussion for another time. Um, coming back to the idea of peace, you know, um, if taking everything we've been talking about, that what we have, as I said before, is not peace, it doesn't exist. It's not going to be created by the simple uh, uh, event of having an election, you know, um, the election all it can hope to do, you know, the best we can hope for right now is to perpetuate a sense of calm, and it's only a sense of calm for some people, mm -hmm. you know, it's not for everybody, you know, um, people who live close to Boni are still going to be under occupation, guys in Kapedo are still going to be killed by the KDF, you know, mm -hmm. that won't change, that, the election itself won't bring peace. We've, we can't run away from doing the work of peace. And I think that's what I was trying to push out, is that when we talk of it as if there is an actual possibility that if we vote in, whether it's Raila or Kenyatta, that they will bequeath us with, with peace, peace, as if it is something we are going to be given, you know, <laughs> by somebody who will somehow one day stop oppressing us or whatever. That's not going to happen. The machinery of the colonial state is designed to oppress. Mm. And that design is not going to go away until we dismantle it. You know? So regardless of who is sworn in, regardless. and regardless of the circumstances, mm -hmm. whether or not we had this thing of, ah, you know the world, yeah. you thought you'd see us fight and we didn't. Right. And you know Kenyans, we have that in 2013, that mm -hmm. sense of we showed the world. Right. Yet here we are, five years later, we're back to that same sense of unease. Mm -hmm. So your point is, regardless of who gets sworn in, Regardless of whether we pick regardless, up... In fact, let's, let's even uh, put it in more stark terms. Regardless of whether we have a free, fair, and credible election, we will not have peace because it is not the election that brings peace. 
you know the peace will only come when we do the work of peace which is to dismantle the machinery of oppression to integrate justice security predictability life mm. into the everyday experience yes, of so these famous. people we call Kenyans yes. you know yes. and that okay, is so not done by asking not to cast a vote mm. you all know mm. mm. i want us to deal with this thing that most people fear okay mm. we've all agreed with you mm. and we'll come back and explore what is that long term work mm. but what does that mean for that week after the, you know mm. we've cast our vote on 8th Mm. We have 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th. Mm. What therefore are we saying about peace? Well, well let me say uh, one thing very quickly. Um, uh, I don't say I don't disparage that the calmness, mm -hmm. you know, that the sense of <laughs> people not walking around with pangas and yes. uh, uh, killing people is itself not valuable. Mm. You know, um, I think over and above, I mean, things can't get worse. Over and above the infrastructure of fear and, uh, and violence that we already have, things can't get uh, uh, much worse. Mm. So it's not to say that um, uh, we shouldn't value and try and preserve that. But we shouldn't call that peace because that leads us to a sense of we've achieved it. And this is what happened exactly after 2013. Mm. You know, after 2007 and the violence of 2008, everybody knew we didn't have it. That's why we pushed for Agenda 4 and let's have, mm -hmm. let's resolve those conflicts. You know? But after 2013, we all sat back, accepted and moved on and said we had peace. So when the TJRC presented its report, our idea was, oh, nice, no longer too necessary, it's mm -hmm. not really urgent. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. And we packed it in Parliament. You know, we don't discuss it and stuff. And now we are discovering, well, actually, those ghosts didn't go away. Mm -hmm. They are still there, you know, and we need to deal with them. Mm -hmm. So let's not call it peace. Let's call it for what it is. It's just a continuation of calm. And there is another thing we've got to really think about, about this calm. It's calm for what, to what end? Mm -hmm. And if it is a calm that simply allows the machinery of extraction to continue, because we can't keep silent, you know, because mm. nobody's walking around with pangas and stuff, then that calm, if we maintain it, becomes inimical to us in the long run. Mm. You know, so we, I think, need to sit back and say, all right, let's not, we're not asking for people to go killing their neighbors and stuff, but let's think a bit deeper about what we need to do so we don't actually need to fear that eventuality. Mm. You know, so we're not feeling that we're sitting on a volcano and all just all managing to <laughs> yes, yeah, all exactly. the time. And then when that moment of crisis comes, we're all panicking. Mm -hmm. But then the minute the crisis, you know, the volcano rumbles and then it goes quiet. Mm -hmm. We're not working on how do we make sure that eruption mm -hmm. doesn't happen again. Mm -hmm. Do you guys agree with Patrick? Completely. Back, back to the metaphor of the big boat that's in the ocean. Mm -hmm. If you repair the holes now, if you can repair, if you do the work, spend a little time repairing those holes. Uh, clearing the uh, clearing uh, clearing the decks, uh, you know, uh, you know, putting in the instruments or of the putting in the you know the instruments that will help navigate storms because the the instruments to navigate storms are within our own capability. It means that the next storm that comes becomes a, a great adventure rather than a source of existential threat or dread. Mm. And it and it's and it, and it's the the harder work is that is that. The, the work, the work in creating the infrastructure where peace can be a fruit. Um, because it means that we'd have to talk to one another. It would mean we'd have to, uh, I'd have to um, meet you as a human being mm -hmm. who honors my own humanity. You know, I'd have to meet you as a, in a hospitable way, whoever you are, because we are on this ship together. But it would also mean that we'd have to agree are we, are we, do we want to save this ship? Do we agree we want to save this ship? Do we agree that this ship is going to take us to that which we need, what, that which we seek and we hope to achieve? Okay, if we're in agreement, let's work on it together. Mm -hmm. But I don't think we've ever come to this place of agreement. I think we are these people who found ourselves aboard this vessel mm -hmm. called Kenya. I, I think there's an agreement we came to in 2010 when we ratified the Constitution. I think there was a sense of hope that... I, I don't know, there was just, and that was just my gut feeling, there was something different in the air when mm -hmm. we were happy and celebrating that constitution. But because our institutions and our, our daily life 
is not yet reflecting what we affirmed in 2010, mm -hmm. then we've become disillusioned. So for me, I would say I would like us to tap into that hope that we had in 2010 and into the hope of 202. 202, that was amazing. It was that just was amazing. amazing. The, the euphoria. We, but it yeah, was but those exciting. Are, uh, those, those are the, yes. the, the different, I mean, the euphoric moments. Yes. Where a different Kenya exists, existed, um, uh, and it's not just why does um, it exist, and it's not just because there's this sort of um, fundamental sort of uh, except even hope that it can all be better. It doesn't have to be the way it has manifested itself. Mm -hmm. um, and I think about um, uh, the uh, two th uh, thousand eight for me was quite a, a, a seminal time mm -hmm. because um, in January. You have all these guys moving around with pangas and stuff, and it's Kikuyu versus Kalenjin versus uh, Lu. And 2008, in August, you have the Olympics, and there's a Kalenjin guy winning, and there's my father, Kikuyu, there, you know, jumping up and cheering him on. Mm -hmm. I'm saying, this guy, eight months ago, mm -hmm. was not a Kenyan too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know. And now he is. Yeah, so in those moments, you know, yeah. when we are sporting moments. excellence, yeah. you know, yeah. we were, you see people almost come together and celebrate something called yeah. Kenya. Those are roots where, those are the glimpses we have of what is possible. And um, I like who the, we are, who right, we actually are, I think. To go back to the metaphor you gave of, 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 of the ship. I think a lot of times we get, and what I'm calling calm, is this idea that we can patch up things and just get past this. Mm, you know? But storm. every time that the next storm comes, you're not sure whether our patchwork is going <laughs> to survive it. <laughs> you know? so, and until we actually sit back and say, how do we fix it? So that it is a study vessel. It will take us where we, we want to go. Yeah. You know? So as we wind up, what I'm hearing is that we are, none, nobody here is advocating that the next week should be a week of violence. No. <laughs> but we are saying use that period of calm to, to set the foundation for something in the next five years. Because, you know, you just pointed it out, 2002 was an election, but it wasn't a moment of crisis. Mm -hmm. It was a moment of hope. Mm -hmm. So that in the next week, and as we finish, I want you just to each of you to f make this your closing remarks. Mm -hmm. What needs to happen? in the next week, between now, actually in the next two weeks, between now and the elections and the results, for Kenyans to turn this space into a space, election that is an election of hope. Because we're already so divided. Mm -hmm. We already got all these fears. But we're saying, even if we don't fight, all that it is is a period of calm. Mm -hmm. How do we use the next two weeks to turn that period of calm into a period of peace? Given that there are still those people who want who feel that we're living in a society of injustice. There's still those people who feel that the people who want to kill me to take away what I have, mm -hmm. which what I may not be, ex ex mm -hmm. yes, I've worked hard for it. And I would like, even if the best doesn't come, I would like to continue to have the chance to build this. So in your closing remarks, what does peace look like? How do we get to a space of calm as a way of getting into peace in the next two weeks? Given our scenarios, we might get to an election which is, you know, we're told we have to go for a runoff and people will be disappointed or excited. We might get to an election where one side wins. And I'm thinking, I think it was Godwin Murunga who wrote an article in Praise of Feelings mm -hmm. and said it is very important for the winning side to realize mm -hmm. there's a losing side. Mm -hmm. We might get to an election where one side wins and, you know, everybody is, okay, you know, it's fine, it's fine. We know we lost or we know we won and we won fairly. Given our many scenarios, what would you say needs to happen in the next two weeks? Mm. Yes, I'm doing uh. that thing of saying, you now give me a solution. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think, and, and actually I have already started it with a few of the groups I'm involved in. I've started talk, saying, let's talk about what we are going to do after the election. And it's not... Uh, a thing of uh, accepting and move on, mm. but what are the reforms that we want within the Kenyan nation? Because mm. for me, the Kenyan nation is bigger than the state. Mm. What are the reforms that we want to see happen after after the election? Regardless of whether my country Reg wins regardless of who wins. Like for me, I talk so much, especially about education. And for me, there are so many things that happen 
in education that represent colonialism and oppression. Mm -hmm. Look at our boarding schools. Even the way we celebrate results, exam results, is a celebration of marginalization. Because we say, you, you didn't work hard, that's why you failed, and you, you worked hard and you passed. And we're not mm -hmm. talking about the social infrastructure that allows people to perform in a certain way in exams. Mm -hmm. So for me, talking about this, the daily life, how do we free so to avoid decolonize using the word decolonizing but how do we free our daily life so that it is mm. an expression of humanity mm. that is the conversation mm. i would like us to see but on the immediate let me be honest and this may be controversial there is a lot of pent up emotion so i am not naive mm. that it could erupt what I hope is that we can let it erupt in a way that we are not going to fight each other while mm. politicians go to Serena and take tea. <laughs> so I wish we would have our own Tahrir Square where it is mm. us, the people who are protesting and we are not protesting on, on the terms of the politicians. It's on our own terms. So that is, the, for me, I would say that is the immediate solution. Mm -hmm. But the, po the longer term solution would be to continue the conversation about what we want to happen immediately after elections. Let us not celebrate anybody. I don't think there's anyone to celebrate. We have a broken, leaking ship. And the point is that we fix it or we build a new one. It is not that we are happy that the captain has changed or is the mm -hmm. same. Mm -hmm. It's that we have a new ship that reflects our sensibilities and our needs. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Wangia. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think that, I mean, going with the, the, the metaphor of the ship, you know, which I think is, is very apt, um, is we are now faced with our tempest. You know? mm -hmm. um, it's here, we are not going to escape it. You know? So I think the first thing, uh, the most immediate thing, is to make sure you can get past this, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And for me, the, the important thing right now is to ensure that the election we do have is credible, is fair, you know. And I think that's a, a, a something that we should all be invested in. I don't think it is for one side mm -hmm. uh, uh, to, to, to be pushing. I think it's all Kenya should be saying we need to have an election that when we come out at the other side, you know, we are not more damaged than we are. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's a material who wins, in a sense, you know, but that the process itself um, uh, is credible. Um, I think in the aftermath of that, we've got to understand all we have done, all we will have done, assuming we do that uh, successfully, is gotten, just gotten past that storm. And we've got to really look at the seaworthiness of our ship. You know, and to go back and start an actual conversation about how do we fix it? You know, how do we either fix it, or as Wandia says, get a new one? You know, uh, over this, and that's a much more um, longer-term conversation that needs to start immediately. So I think after the election, it won't be the time to start patting ourselves in the back or mm -hmm. celebrating that we won or whatever. You know, all we've done is survive. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. then now how do we build a structure that would allow us to actually thrive? You know, uh, so do. The, the other option um, the, that's there is you do end up with uh, an election that is not seen as credible or by a substantial proportion of the population. I think that we've got um, choices to make. Um, I think we need to consider how we react to uh, a, an election that is not credible. And I've got to say that if there's one thing that history teaches us is we cannot build justice on a bedrock of injustice. Mm -hmm. So we can't ourselves who are demanding justice for the election go about being unjust to other people, so taking bangers and stuff and going after them. Mm -hmm. you know. So there's got to be rules about how we behave you know, afterwards. If we are going to protest, who are we protesting? We're protesting this infrastructure that has given us mm -hmm. a false election, not the people, you know, who might have been seen to have voted in a way we did not like, mm -hmm. you know. So um, that has to be gone. But also, more importantly, we've got to put pressure on the government itself, you know, the state itself, because lots of the violence stems from that state, mm -hmm. you know, so that it will respect rights, you know, in the aftermath of the election, right? Rights for people to assemble, 
rights mm-hmm. to picket and protest, mm-hmm. rights to expression. Mm-hmm. You know, all these the government has to be forced to to whatever to accept. And even if it's your side that wins, you should not think that by muzzling the other guys, you know, by beating them sort of into submission, that uh, and into humility. silence, by humility, yeah, that you you actually better your your situation. You actually make it worse. You're mm-hmm. actually creating the and sowing mm-hmm. the seeds for much worse conflict down the road. Mm-hmm. So whatever happens after this, let's understand we wouldn't have achieved peace, you know, and. We will be in this boat together, you know, mm-hmm. and it serves no one's interest for mm-hmm. us to either celebrate the diminution of other people's concerns, mm-hmm. you know, or for us to sit back and think that simply getting our own captain is, <laughs> is, is, is the goal or it's going to improve things. No, it won't, you know. Mm-hmm. We've got to understand it either works for everybody or it works for nobody. Right. Yes. And can I, sorry, can I just add... Mm-hmm. I hope that when we have those conversations about fixing the ship or replacing it, we are not shut down as we've been being shut mm-hmm. down for the last five years, being told what's your solution, shut up and join politics, which is what I have been told. Mm-hmm. You know, this when we tell people that, when we tell Gadara, why are you not in parliament, why are you talking mm-hmm. on Twitter, we are shutting down the possibilities of reform without needing elections. Mm -hmm. So Kenyans need to understand that these conversations are what propel us to the next level. They're part of the process. It's part of the process. Mm -hmm. It's not just noise making about politics. It is preventing a meltdown in 2022 Mm -hmm. or never. We have to encourage these conversations and participate in them, not just Mm -hmm. shut people down because the the people who are talking about them. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Gadara. Thank you, Wendia. Yvonne? Mm-hmm. Both Wendia and Gadara, I think, have covered, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, have very succinctly, um, I think, outlined a kind of map for what's next. What I would add, add is simply that these this next few days is about the test of the institution of the IBC. So it, it's a test, and uh, we are its examiners. Um, and let's see what the result will be. Um, the outcome, whatever the outcome, I trust that the fact that in this day and age and moment, we are also talking about the death of a young man and a young woman uh, caused by the event of this election experience. A, a brilliant young man who is perceived to have been standing in the way of something. The fact that in an election process, a human sacrifice was made in this country, that it, whatever the outcome, whoever wins, I think it is absolutely necessary to go back into this moment and ask, how could this happen? Why did it happen? And, for, and to what purpose did it happen? We cannot allow the death of one person. The death of this man and, and, and this woman diminishes every single one of us, whoever will win. And we're lesser because of that, of that happening. Mm-hmm. In the same way that we were diminished by the death of those who have, all those we know who have come before, right? The, the, the death of the 1,000, mm-hmm. uh, you know, in 2007, 2008, post-election violence. If you look about the future. My future is a very small future. My, my Kenyan future is a very small future. What do we do with the ghosts? It's, it's that simple. What, what are we going to do with those ghosts in order, to, in order for us to even dream of, dare to dream of a future? Thank you, Yvonne. You know, it occurs to me that when you think of the way the conversation has gone right through, we've actually talked our way through from the preamble of the Constitution because... If one was thinking of those words, you know, there, there, there's this line, honoring the sacrifice of those who've gone before. Mm-hmm. And the preamble actually tells us, this is how we, we've come. We've come a long way to be here. But then we also have a responsibility. Mm-hmm. It also takes me to Article 1, 2, and 3, where this thing of the sovereignty of the people means that the process, mm-hmm. as you said, is up to us. Mm-hmm. We are the ones who must um, mark the credibility of the institutions. We are the ones who must make sure that we are satisfied that the election is credible. And if it is not, that we are responsible 
we carry the responsibility of this legacy that we carry mm -hmm. to make sure that if people feel they must protest, if people feel they must continue to engage, it, we engage responsibly. We don't see each other as enemies, but we are saying we, the people of Kenya, mm -hmm. as the preamble starts. Mm -hmm. But then it goes to Article 3, we must defend the constitution. We must make sure that this constitution isn't, you know, you put it very well, the fact that we, it was promulgated means nothing unless we implement it. And that that responsibility to say that whoever becomes president, governor, MCA, member of parliament, whatever, women's rep, we are working to make sure that we change the systems. We really have to make the kind of Kenya that in 2022, it becomes an election of hope again, not an election of crisis. And from all of us in the studios at The Elephant, we hope that that will be your responsibility. Thank you.